Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I think the sound's on. There you go. Good to see everyone this morning. And uh, we see some spring in the horizon these days. Doesn't feel like it quite yet this morning, but it's coming. <laughs> Let's just open this morning, I'll, I'll read from Psalm 61. Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. Father, we just thank you that we can gather here today. Thank you for your goodness and your love for us. We thank you that we have the freedom to be, be able to gather and to fellowship and to worship you this morning. And we're just grateful for all that you do. Thank you for uh, each one that's here today. I'm just work in each one's heart. And let us honor you in all that we do in Jesus' name. Amen. Been out busy on tour, playing at big conferences. And, yeah. <laughs> Good to have them back. Anyway. <laughs> you can keep my wife and son, Taya and Timothy, are in prayer. They're not feeling well today, so pray for them a little bit later, too. There have been, it seems to be a lot of colds and flus going around these days, so yeah, I'm sure there's lots of people that can, can use prayer. <coughs> Let's worship together this morning. <clears throat> Splendor of a king, clothed oh, in majesty, and all the earth rejoices, all the earth rejoices. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. Oh, 
Oh, 
Susan called the insurance company and said, we had a barn insured for $50,000 and I want my money. The agent replied, that's not quite how it works, Susan. Insurance doesn't work that quite that way. We will ascertain the value of what is insured, provide you with a new one comparable to its worth. There was a long pause. Susan replied, I'd like to cancel the policy of my husband. <laughs> if you turn with me in your Bibles 
to the book of 2 Corinthians. We're going to read verses chapter 1, verse 23, to chapter 2, verse 11. And if you'd like to stand with me as we read God's word together, 2 Corinthians beginning in chapter 1, verse 23. Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul, that to spare you I came no more to Corinth. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. But I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who is made sorrowful by me? And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you that all my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you, with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. This punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man. So that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him. Lest perhaps such one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test. Whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, and we pray as we look at this passage this morning, you would help us to apply some truths to our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. You know, there's a huge weight as a leader when you are leading and you're, you're asking God to help you to lead. And you can feel Paul's heart. We talked about how this is the most transparent book that Paul wrote. He's really, it's almost like he's, in a way, it's almost like he's journaling. He's letting you in in his heart what he's going through. He's talking here about tears. I'm writing to you in tears. He's talking about, about you know, that I, I, I thought about it, but when I'm going to come to you, and I don't want to come to you in sorrow. He's being very transparent. And, you know, as, as, as someone who, who, who is, is a pastor, I have to tell you, you know, it, pray, for, pray, for, pray for pastors. Pray for me. Pray for leaders. It's not easy, you know, when we meet with our elders and we, we talk about things, especially when you go through trouble. It's not easy when you're a leader going through trouble. And you know what happens, we're going to be talking about forgiveness and, 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 and different things here. But you know, what happens when you're leading a group? The problem is, it's not just what, what you do, everybody sees. And, and you're trying to lead, and you're trying to lead in, in, in with God's, God's leading, and you're trying to lead in a proper way. And when you're leading, other people are watching. You know, and, and, and you know, this, this past few years, it's been very difficult leading because we've been going through things we've never gone through before. And it's hard. And we, 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 we seek your prayers. Pray for, pray for us. And you know what Paul was doing here? See, one of the challenges, it, it is one thing to deal with confrontation and, and Matthew 18 talks about the principles of confrontation. You go to that person, and then you bring someone with you, and then you and then you go go before, you bring them before the church. And, and Jesus is very clear how you deal with that one person. But what do you do when you're confronting in a group? And I experienced this 
back in 1987 when my wife and I were on our first mission trip to Brazil. And I watched this, this missionary. And what had happened is someone in his church, this, this guy in his church, <coughs> got his girlfriend pregnant. And now it was time for them to get married. And so what they did in Brazil, we would, we would go to these meals, they called them rachrasco, it was like this big barbecue, and all these, all these cuts of meat was wonderful, it was really good food and everything. And I heard about this, I heard what they were going to do with this couple. They didn't get to have the shrasco. So what they did is they, they're going to put them in a car and they're going to drive them around, and, and everyone was going to see that they, 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 they were not going to get the shrasco. They had this other type of meal for them. And she didn't get to wear a white dress. And, and you know, honestly, what I, Linda and I talked about this, and I thought, I said, Linda, I, I can't let this go. And I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a, you know, I'd rather not confront if I can do it. But you know, like I, I, I just before God, I just felt I had to go say something to him. So I went and talked to him about it. And I said, I said to him, you know, I'm just in a time. Of, you know, way more about ministry. You're older than me. You've been ministry a long time. I'm just a kid. I'm just a college student. I'm just here to serve. But, but I, I, I just can't not say something. I have to say something. The, to me, to me, this looks like you're a celebration of sin, not a celebration of marriage. That's what it looks like to me. And, and I didn't, I didn't understand, totally understand their culture and everything that was going on there. And I'm going to tell you, I've thought about it since then. Did I even do the right thing? Did I do the right thing? I don't know. By confronting him, I don't know. Because you know what? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is what he had. They had all these girls and not as many guys. And he is trying to deal with this situation and so that all the other young people don't do the same thing. And he needed God's wisdom. And, and it's not easy making decisions as a leader. It's not easy. And Paul's dealing with this situation. He's dealing with the situation of there's this man who's doing things that makes the people in Corinth blush that aren't in the church. He's got a relationship with his mother-in-law. And we read about this in 1 Corinthians. And so now here Paul's talking about this person and, 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 and um, I want to take a moment just hold that thought. We'll, we'll go back to it. But I want to take a moment. I got my hand slapped this week. I was listening to a pastor preaching from this passage and I got confronted. And I want to apologize to you folks. See, you know what? I've talked about this, we've talked about this, that there's perhaps a lost letter or lost letters. And he made, he, he talked about this, this whole idea of this lost letter thing. And there very, very well may be a lost letter, but I want to qualify this because this is how I got my hands slapped on this. God has given us his word. It is the word of God. And don't you think God can't protect his word? The word of God is the word of God. And when we talk about scripture missing, scriptures lost letters, understand this. The Bible is inspired by God and the Bible is the Bible that we have. And the Bible is protected by God and, and, and it is God's word. And we only have to watch how Jesus treated the Old Testament to know he believed it was the inspired word of God. When he talked about Jonah, he talked about him as an actual person, Jonah. He said when the when Jonah was in Jonah was in was in the was in the belly of the whale, it's just the same way the Son of Man will be in the earth for three days. And, and understand something. Jesus taught this is the word of God, and it is the word of God. And and let us not be deceived to ever say the word of God is not the word of God, because there's such an attack on the word of God right now. There's such an attack on it. It is the word of God. So when we talk about possible missing things, it's very obvious God didn't want us to have it because if, it, if he did, it'd be in here. <coughs> okay? So let's just think of that, right? So anyways, we're going to continue on. So what happens is, uh, Paul is confronting. And he's confronting, and he's, he's trying to show love to these people. And we're going to look at two 
points this morning. What are two things, or pardon me, actually we're going to look at one thing. We're at, it's, two, it's two thoughts, but, in, but we're going to look at this two thoughts in one. Okay? We need to, as we look at this passage, as we apply it to our lives, we need to forgive like Jesus and love like Jesus. We need to forgive like Jesus and love like Jesus. Now, you know, it, it, it occurred to me, I was, I was sitting in the Sunday school class this morning, we were reading through 1 Peter chapter 1. Such a wonderful passage. You know, and it reminded me of what, what, what it was like when we read through the book of uh, the, the epistle, 1 John. Because Peter's talking about love. And he's talking about, about how much we need to love one another. And, and, that's the way John talked. And we just went through 1 Corinthians when we read through 1 Corinthians 13. And the way Paul talks about love. And you know what John and, and, and Peter and, and, and Paul all had in common? They've all been around Jesus. Now, Paul wasn't around him physically, but he was around him at the Damascus Road. And there's many scholars that believe when he went to Arabia that, that the Lord Jesus literally spoke to him, showed him what he wanted to write. And, and it's just, it's powerful. Those, 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 those men of God that were around Jesus. Now, now understand something this morning. Remember when Jesus was with his disciples and he says, it's good that I go away. Why did he say it was good that he goes away? You know why he said it's good that he goes away? Because then I can send the comforter. And the same God who James and John and Peter and all these disciples who became apostles, when they hung out with Jesus, the same God, do you know he dwells in you? He dwells in you. And he wants to spend time with you, literally every day. And so, and God speaks to us. And we read his word and he speaks to us. And it's wonderful. So when we learn more about love and forgiveness, we learn more about this from, from the Lord. We learn more about this in his word. So when we read one book and we, we find that it, it's, it's speaking to us like another book in the Bible and another book, and it's what we're, what's happening here, what we want to talk about here is we need to forgive like Jesus and love like Jesus. Take a look at verse 8. It says, Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. Therefore I, re I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. Paul is, is saying to them, you need to love this man. Now understand something. You know what Paul is not saying? Because he, he talked about it in the first book. He's not saying, oh yeah, you just tell him, if, if you can live however you want. Sin isn't sin. You can do... See, see that's, that's the way people talk today. That's not, that's not what Paul was teaching. Sin is sin, and Jesus died for sin because it's so terrible. But he loves the sinner. And what are we to do? We are to love people. To love people the way Jesus loves us. And, and you know, we, we have... We need to confront sin in our own lives. We need to confront sin as parents. You need to confront sin in your children, as in your grandchildren. You need, to, you need to call sin what it is. It's sin. But we love the person. We love the sinner. We love the person we do. That's what, but that's what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to forgive like Jesus and love like Jesus. Take a look at verse 10. It says, Now when you forgive anything, I also forgive, for if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. You know, what, what is Paul saying there? He's saying, like it says in a lot of places in Scripture, we need to have a forgiving heart. We need to know sin is sin, and sin needs to be confronted but we need to have a forgiving heart. Now, we, we mentioned for a minute uh, Matthew 18. 
let's look let's look at Matthew 18 for a minute when we look at as, as we look at this 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 um, principle we're looking at this morning to forgive like Jesus and love like Jesus and it says in Matthew 18 it talks about how, how what we do when we're confronting someone it says if your brother has sins against you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone if he hears you you've gained your brother if he will not hear you take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses Every word may be established. If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses even to hear the church, let, let him be to you like the heathen and the tax collector. So Jesus gives us pr principles here. How do we confront? And we need to go by that, right? Now, later on in the chapter, Peter asks a question in chapter 18. He said, Lord... How often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Or actually in the, in the New King James it says seven, 70 times. Yeah, 70 times seven. And some, of, some versions say 77 times. I don't think it really matters if it's 70 times 7 or 77 times. What's the principle that Jesus is saying? You, you know what he's saying? He's saying, you need to one to be a forgiver. You need to one who, one who loses count, not keeps count, of those who pay. You need to be one who loses count, not keeps count. See, Peter's keeping count. He says to Jesus, see, see, you know, some believe what happened is, is someone, someone had uh, maybe offended him a couple of times. And maybe it was one of the disciples. It's probably John. Who knows? You know, who knows? Or maybe it was Matthew. We don't know. Anyways, what happens? How many times do I forgive? He goes to Jesus. He's being generous. He, because, you know, in the Old Testament, they you know, just a few times. You only, you know, and then, and then, you know here he's seven, seven times. And what is Jesus telling him? No, you need to be one who loses count. Right? You, you, you know, to have a good marriage, you know, I've heard this said, I'm sure you've heard this said before. You know what a good marriage is? It's two good forgivers. Two good forgivers. You know, if we're going to love like Jesus and forgive like Jesus, you know what we're going to do? We're going to forgive. We're going to forgive. We're going to have a forgiving heart. And, 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 and you know, what does that mean? You know, uh, don't keep a black book. Don't keep a black book. Is that what it means? You know, and and why is it we often hurt the people we love the most, and we do sometimes, don't we do that? But we need to have a forgiving heart. We need to have a a, a loving heart. I, uh, I just want to take a, a minute here and just talk a little bit about one of my car favorite characters in the in the Bible, Joseph. Joseph, way back in Matthew. You know, and I want to bring your attention to the last chapter of Genesis. And his brothers come to, to him. Jacob had just died. And they said, this is what his brother says, I beg you, please forgive the trespass. They're, they're telling him, Dad said this. I beg you, please forgive the trespasses of your brothers and their sins, for they did evil to you. And this is Joseph's response. He wept. And he said, do not be afraid. For am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as it is to this day to save the people. <clears throat> do you know, think of Joseph. And think of that story. He has this dream when he's a boy that his brothers were bowed down to him. And can you imagine him that day? He's dressed to the nines, the most powerful man next to the Pharaoh in, in the land. He's unrecognizable to his brothers, but he sees them come in and he sees them bow before him. Talk about a moment in time. You know, for a moment he must have just sat there and just thought, or maybe he thought it later. 
I was sold as a slave. I spent time in prison. And now I became the most powerful man in the land. And God has brought about my dream that I had when I was a boy. My brothers are bowing before me. And you know what happens, right? You know what happens. He does this whole thing of putting their money back in their pouch and their pouches and 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 and, and all these things go on and, and he, he, he said he tells them that oh, I don't believe you guys are spies. He tells them you're spies, and then and then the whole thing happens with, 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 with Benjamin coming and, and, and Judah, the man who sold Jesus as a slave, or sold Joseph as a slave. Judah assures his dad. Because he tells them, you're, you're not going to see any more grain. If you don't bring Benjamin here, because I believe you're spies. I don't believe you're, you are who you say you are. He shows back up there. They show back up there with Benjamin. Can you imagine? He's, he sees his brother. He, that he's okay. Because all this time, he's been wondering, what's going on with my family? And then the time comes when he reveals himself to his, to his family. To his brothers, he makes he makes all of the he makes all of the men uh, that are in the room leave, probably to protect his brothers. Because if they found out that what he did, who knows what would happen to them, right? So what happens now? Judah, who sold him as a slave, he says, when when they find the cup in Benjamin's bag, Judah says. Oh, take me instead. Take me instead. Take me instead. And you know what Joseph's seen? He's seen Judah, the one that sold him. It's, his heart had been changed. And it's a picture of Christ. Judah was willing to give his life for his brother. And one day, many, many years later, from the tribe of Judah, Jesus would be born. And he would die on a cross. And when we talk about love like Jesus and forgive like Jesus, think of Jesus on that cross as he's looking down and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When we love like Jesus and forgive like Jesus, you know, you know, you know the, the love that describes Jesus, the gap of love, an unconditional love, a love that forgives a love that loves. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we pray, Father, that you would help us. Help us, Lord, to have a loving heart, a forgiving heart for one another. Lord, help us to never not treat sin seriously. You always treated sin seriously. You never said sin isn't sin. But what you did do is you forgave sin. You forgave. You forgave people who hurt you. And Lord, we pray, Father, for each one in this room, Lord. Maybe there's someone that we're, we have a bit of a strained relationship with right now. Maybe there's an issue there. Maybe there's an issue in our heart that we need to forgive. And Lord, we think of the Lord's Prayer and it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lord, help us to forgive other people. And as we forgive other people, you forgive us. And Lord, help us to take it seriously, to take sin seriously as, as you do, but to take forgiveness seriously as you do, Lord. You forgive. That's what grace is, Lord. You forgive. And thank you that you do. You've modeled it for us. Help us to have a forgiving heart. Lord, to not keep offenses, to not keep a black book, to not keep count of the people who've hurt us, but, but Lord, to lose count and to have a forgiving heart. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. And maybe there's someone here that's never given their heart to Jesus. I just want to give you a moment to just pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, would you come into my heart? Would you forgive me of my sin? Thank you, Lord, that you died on the cross for me. And I want my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want to go to heaven. 
I thank you that you made a way, Lord Jesus, by dying on a cross. You, you who lived a perfect life, you took all of my sins on you. And it's like you lived my life and died the way I should have died. But then now I am able to have my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life and go to heaven because you died for me. Thank you, Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a good song, uh, just in the context of this of the message today, as we think about uh, the forgiveness of God and just the, uh, the love that God has for us. Reckless love is an uh, uh, interesting choice of a word. Some different opinions on uh, whether that's the right word to use, but it's just uh, good to be reminded that uh, to, as we sing these words that God's forgiveness comes no matter what, um, and just even before we even live our life. We think about the forgiveness He has for us. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. So good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You've been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming never ending Oh, the overwhelming never ends. 
Father, we thank you for your overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love. Lord, you love us so much. You went to such extremes to restore relationship with your Father, and we thank you, Lord, that our Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you love us so much. Help us, Lord, to be loving and forgiving as we leave these doors. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he give you grace and peace.